Chapter One of Nelly Channel. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Jennifer Painter. Nelly Channel by Sarah Dowdney. Chapter One The Home at Huntsdean and Its New Inmates. It was the dreariest of November days. The only bright spot was a crimson sumac, spreading its gorgeous foliage against the watery grey of the sky and misty background of fog-hidden fields. It was a day that made the burdens of life seem heavier than they really were, and set the heart aching for the sunshine of the vanished summer. The scene was as still as death, there was not wind enough to lift the pale vapours that hung over the meadows. No kindly breezes came to the poor brown leaves heaped on the wayside and carried them off to quiet hollows where they might have decent burial. Better rain and tempest than such a gloomy calm as this, and better the roar and rattle of the train than the heavy jog-trot of the carrier's horses and the rumble of his wagon. It will never be the same home again, said Rhoda Farron to herself, as the old grey cottage came into sight. There was the low, moss-grown wall, built of flints. There were the splendid sumacs, brightening the desolate garden. Rhoda and her cousin Helen had chased each other along those grassy paths when they were children. But they were women now, and had put away childish things. Rhoda loved her cousin reasonably well, yet not well enough to give up her own bedroom to her and her baby. The baby was the principal grievance. Rhoda had had very little to do with children, and being of a studious turn, she did not want to improve her acquaintance with them. In reading her favourite books, she always skipped the parts that related their sayings and doings. It was, therefore, no small cross to find an infant of two months old introduced into the family circle. For there she had hoped to reign supreme. She had a presentiment that there would be rivalry between the baby and herself, a struggle for mastery, in which her little opponent might possibly be victor. Baby lips would laugh her down if she attempted remonstrance. Even parents and a fond brother might be won over to the cause of the small usurper. For three years, Rhoda Farron had been living away from home, only coming back for a fortnight at Christmas, and sometimes for a few days in midsummer. Neighbours and friends had looked upon her as fortunate. She had held the post of companion to the rich widow of a London merchant, and had been well treated and not ill remunerated. The widow was lately dead, and Miss Farron was returning to her home with an annuity of twenty pounds, to be paid regularly by Mrs. Elton's executors. Mrs. Elton had not been difficult to live with, and her companion had adapted herself to her ways more readily than most girls of twenty would have done. The quiet house in Cavendish Square had been no uncheerful home, but the mode of life there had strengthened Rhoda's habits of self-indulgence. She had had ample time for reading and musing. No harsh words had chafed her temper. No small nuisances had planted thorns in her path. They had few visitors. Weeks would pass without their hearing other voices than those of the servants. It did not matter to them that there were mighty things done in the great world. It was an unwholesome life for two women to lead, a life of cramped interests and narrow thoughts. Helen had been living in Islington while Rhoda was in Cavendish Square. But in those days, Miss Farron never went to see anybody, and she excused herself for not visiting Helen by saying that Mrs. Elton did not like her to be gadding about. Thus it came to pass that she had not even once seen her cousin's husband. She knew that Robert Claris had taken Helen from her situation of nursery governess and had married her after a brief acquaintance. 
Rhoda's parents were Helen's only surviving relatives, and they had given their full consent to the match. It was not a bad match for a penniless girl to make, for Robert Claris was a confidential clerk in the office of Mr. Elton, son of the widow in Cavendish Square. It was in July that Mrs. Elton's health began to fail. Rhoda Farron saw the change stealing over her, day by day, and knew what it portended. In a certain way she had been fond of the old woman, but it was an attachment without love. There would be no great pain when the ties between them were broken, and Rhoda was conscious of this. She was even angry with herself for not being more sorry that Mrs. Elton was dying. "'The worry of life is wearing me out, Rhoda,' said the widow one day, when Miss Farron had found her violently agitated and in tears. It surprised her not a little to hear that Mrs. Elton had any worries. But when the wind shakes the full tree, there is always a great rustling of the leaves. The bare bough does not quake. It has nothing to lose. Mrs. Elton had been a rich woman from her youth upward, and she could not bear that a single leaf should be torn from her green branches. "'I've had a dreadful loss, Rhoda,' she continued. "'A loss in my business.' The business is mine, you know. I always said my son should never have it while I was alive. But of course I have let him carry it on for me. And very badly he has managed. That confidential clerk of his, Clarice, has robbed me of three hundred pounds. You surely don't mean my cousin Helen's husband, Mrs. Elton? cried Rhoda. "'How should I know anything about his being your cousin's husband?' said the old lady peevishly. "'His wife is a very unlucky woman, whoever she is. Three hundred pounds have been paid into Clarice's hands for me, and he has embezzled every shilling of it. My son always had a ridiculous habit of petting the people he employed. This is what has come of it.' "'Is he in prison?' faltered Rhoda. No, I am sorry to say that he isn't. Those lazy idiots, the detectives, have let him slip. He has had the impertinence to write a canting letter to my son, telling him that every farthing shall be restored. The fugitive was not captured. Perhaps Mr. Elton had a secret liking for the ci devant clerk, and did not care to have him too hotly pursued. Poor, lonely Helen had travelled without delay to her uncle's house, and there her little girl had entered this troublesome world. At the end of October, Mrs. Elton had ceased to fret for the three hundred pounds, and had gone where gold and silver are of small account. And on this November afternoon, Rhoda Farron had returned to her old home once more. Bond, the carrier, had picked up Miss Farron and her belongings when the train had set her down at the rural railway station. Then came the five-mile drive to Huntstein, over the roads that she had often traversed in her girlhood. The pallid mist clung to every branch of the familiar trees, and veiled the woodland alleys where she had watched the rabbits and squirrels in bygone times. Not a gleam of sunshine welcomed her back to the old haunts. Not a brown hare leaped across her path. Not a bird sent forth a note of welcome. Nature and Rhoda were in the same mood on that memorable day. But if the whole scene had been radiant with flowers, Rhoda would still have chosen to sit down upon her little handful of thorns. She told herself again and again that her good days were done, was she not coming home to find the house invaded and her own room occupied by the wife and child of a thief? Yes, a thief. She called him that hard name a dozen times and even whispered it as she sat under the wagon tilt. It is a humbling fact that humanity finds relief in calling names. Aye, it is a miserable thing to know that we have fastened many a bitter epithet 
on some whose names are written in the book of life. "'Whoa!' cried Bon to his horses. The ejaculation might have been applied to Rhoda, for it was a woeful visage that emerged from the tilt and met the gaze of John Farron as he came out of the garden gate. "'You don't look quite so young as you did, Rhoda,' he said, when he had lifted her from the wagon and set her on her feet. "'There are birds that pluck the feathers from their own breasts.' For hours Rhoda had been silently graving lines upon her face, and deliberately destroying the bloom and freshness that God meant her to keep. But she did not like to be told of her handiwork. When Miss So-and-so's friends remark that she is getting passé, is it any comfort to her to know that her own restless nature, and not time, has deprived her of her comeliness? Many a woman is lovelier in her maturity than in her youth. But it is a kind of beauty that comes with the knowledge of the things that belong unto her peace. John looked after her boxes and paid the carrier. The wagon rumbled on through the village, the black retriever barking behind it, to the exasperation of Bond's dog, which was tethered under the wain. Then the brother put his hands on his sister's shoulders, glanced at her earnestly for a moment, and kissed her. "'Mother's waiting for you,' he said. As he spoke, Mrs. Farron appeared in the porch, and at the sight of her, Rhoda's ill temper was ready to take flight. But Helen was behind her, waiting too, waiting to weary her cousin with all the details of her wretched story, and expecting her, perhaps, to pity Robert Clarice. "'It's good to have you back again, my dear,' said the mother's soft voice and glistening eyes. "'Ah, Rhoda,' piped Helen's treble, "'we were children together, were we not? Oh, what sorrows I've gone through, and how I have been longing to talk to you!' Before Miss Farron could reply, a feeble wail arose from the adjoining room. The baby had lost no time in announcing its presence, and Helen hurried into the cradle. Dim as the light was, her mother must have detected the annoyance on Rhoda's face, or perhaps her quick instinct served her instead of sight, for she hastened to say, "'It doesn't often cry, poor little mite, but it's been ailing today.' There was only one flight of stairs in the house. As Rhoda slowly ascended them, the loud, steady ticking of the old clock brought back many a childish memory. Would the hours pass as swiftly and brightly as they had done in earlier years? She sighed as she thought of all the small miseries that would make time hang heavily on her hands. It never even occurred to her then that no true life is long. A fretful spirit will spin hours out of minutes and weeks out of days. I told you, Rhoda, my dear, that we had given your room to Helen. I said so in a letter, didn't I? remarked Mrs. Farron, leading the way into the chamber that she had prepared for her daughter. This is nearly as good, and I felt sure that you would not grudge the larger room to that poor thing and her child. What is to be must be. Rhoda replied. "'Don't stop to unpack anything,' continued her mother, trying not to notice the gloomy answer. "'Come downstairs again as soon as you can. There's a good fire, and a bit of something nice for tea. It's a kind of day that takes the light and colour out of everything,' she added, with a slight shiver. "'I'll never grumble at the weather that God sends, yet I'm always glad when we've got through November.' It was Rhoda who had brought the damp mist indoors. It was Rhoda, God forgive her, who had taken the light and colour out of everything. In looking back upon our lives, we must always see the dark spots where we cast our shadow on another's path, a path which, perhaps, ran very close beside our own. It may be that our dear ones, enfolded in the sunlight of paradise, have forgotten the gloom that we once threw over their earthly way, but we never can. When Rhoda went down into the old parlour, 
she found it glowing with fire and candlelight. Her father had come in from the wet fields and the sheepfolds, and was waiting to give her a welcome. Red curtains shut out the foggy evening, red lights danced on the well-spread table. The baby, lying open-eyed on Helen's lap, had its thumb in its mouth, and seemed disposed for quiet contemplation. The black retriever, stretched upon the hearthrug, had finished a hard day's barking, and was taking his well-earned repose. They gave her the best chair and the warmest seat. All that household love could do was done, and she began to thaw a little under its influence. Once or twice Helen tried to introduce the subject of her troubles, but the farmer and his wife quietly put it aside. Rhoda had made no secret of her resentment. There were many other things to be told, little episodes in village lives, little stories of neighbours and friends. The talk flowed on like a woodland stream that glides over this obstacle and under that. It was threading a difficult and intricate way, but it kept on flowing till night broke up the family group. End of chapter 1「Nelly Channel」This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Jennifer Painter. Nelly Channel by Sarah Dowdney. Chapter 2 Brother and Sister Rhoda Farron Perplexed. The father and mother retired first, then Helen. John seated himself in the farmer's large armchair and looked at Rhoda as she sat on the other side of the fire. These after-supper talks had been a custom with them in the old days. The sister knew by her brother's glance that he understood her mood and was prepared for a long chat. It is a trying thing for a woman that a man will seldom begin a subject however full his heart may be of it. He will wait with indomitable patience until she speaks the first word, and after that he will go on glibly enough. Rhoda first learned to understand something of man's nature by studying John, and she knew perfectly well that she should never get a sentence out of him unless she broke the silence. Well, she said at last, with a little movement of impatience, this is a miserable business. I never thought that I should come back to the old home and find the wife and child of a felon comfortably settled in it. But there is no end to sin, no limit to the audacity of criminals. It is not enough for Robert Clarris to rob his employer. He must also thrust his own lawful burdens on other folk's shoulders. When one commits a crime, replied John gravely, one never foresees what it entails. When Clarice found that discovery was inevitable, he came home to his wife and asked her to fly with him. But she would not go. How could she go? interrupted Rhoda indignantly. Think of her condition and of the misery and disgrace of following his fortunes. He is a base man indeed. John moved uneasily in his chair and kept his eyes fixed on the burning log in the grate. More than once his lips opened and shut again. "'I suppose you'll be very hard on me,' he said at length, "'if I own that I've a sort of tenderness for this poor sinner. I don't mean to make light of his crime, but I believe that when he took the money he intended to pay it back.' "'Oh, John,' said Rhoda severely, "'I am really ashamed of you. What has come to your moral perceptions?' There is a saying that the way to hell is paved with good intentions. Of course this man will try to excuse himself. The world has got into a habit of petting its criminals, and it is one of the worst signs of the times. As Mrs. Elton used to say, it would be well if we could have the good old days back again. The good old days when men were hung for sheep-stealing, and starving women were sentenced to death for taking a loaf. 
retorted John, with unusual heat. "'How I hate to hear that cant about the good old days! "'And when the gallows and the pillory and the stocks were so busy, "'did they stop the Mohawks in their fiendish pranks at night? "'Or did they put down the Gordon riots till the mob had begun to sack and pillage London? "'I am glad the world is changed, and I hope it will go on changing.' If we change from over-severity to over-mercy, we shall just have to go back to over-severity again, replied Rhoda. No, Rhoda, he said more calmly. By that time we shall have got to the days when the earth shall be full of the knowledge of the Lord as the waters cover the seas. Rhoda looked at her brother and wondered. These were strange words to hear from a young man living in a Hampshire village where everything seemed to be standing still? There was no more talk that night. It was evident to Rhoda that John had shot ahead of her in the road of life. Not being able to say whether he were in a bad way or a good way, she said nothing and went to bed. End of chapter 2《Chapter Three of Nelly Channel》This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Jennifer Painter. Nelly Channel by Sarah Dowdney. Chapter Three A Spared Life. News from Robert Claris. The great sorrow is like a mountain in our way. We must either climb to its top or lie grovelling at its base. If we grovel, the path of life is blocked up for ever, and the shadow of our misery is upon us night and day. If we climb, we shall find purer air and fairer regions. Heaven will be nearer to us. The world will lie beneath our feet. We shall bless God for the trial that has lifted us so high above our old selves. We shall comprehend a little of the vast love that reared the mountain. Aye, we shall break forth into singing. Thou, Lord, of thy goodness, hast made my hill so strong. It was clear that Helen would never climb her mountain. In the old days, although she was three years older than her cousin, Rhoda had found out that nothing would ever lift her above the dead level of life. Always beautiful, always commonplace, always a little sly, such were her childish characteristics, and they were unaltered by time. Her beauty was of that kind which inevitably gives a false impression. Every smile was a poem. Every glance seemed to tell of thoughts too deep for words. She was the very impersonation of the German Ella maid, as hollow a piece of loveliness as ever sat by the roadside in the old Schwarzwald and lured unwary travellers to accept the fatal goblet or kiss. When she said tearfully that Robert Claris had fallen in love at their first interview and would not rest till he had married her, Rhoda knew that she spoke the simple truth. No one who looked into the eloquent brown eyes and watched the play of the sweet lips could marvel at Robert's impetuosity. One could understand how that fair face had drawn out the old Samson cry, Get her for me, for she pleaseth me well. I might have done far better, Rhoda, she said plaintively, but I had a hard situation and I wanted to get out of it. You don't know the misery of being nursery governess. One is just like the bat in the fable. Neither a bird nor a beast, neither a lady nor a servant. The position is bad enough for an ugly girl, but it is ten times worse for a pretty one. No one could blame Helen for speaking of her beauty as an established fact. When I was married to Robert, she continued, I soon began to be disappointed in him. There was an end to all the nice little attentions. I was almost his goddess until I became his wife. Oh, that's a very old story, responded Rhoda, 
lovers are just like our old apple trees one would think to see the quantity of blossom that there would be a deal of fruit but there never is great promise and small fulfilment that's always the case with men he was dreadfully stingy went on helen he worried me sadly about my expenses i was not allowed enough money to keep myself decently dressed i think he liked to see me shabby you're wearing a very good dress at this moment remarked rhoda yes this is well enough answered her cousin colouring slightly i was obliged to get things without his leave sometimes or i should have looked like a scarecrow robert would never believe that i wanted any clothes what did he do with the money that he stole rhoda asked abruptly how should i know sighed helen he never gave a shilling of it to me one day he came home and told me quite suddenly that his sin must be discovered i thought that he was crazed and when i found that he was in his right mind i nearly lost my senses never get married rhoda take my advice and be a single woman it is the only way to keep out of misery i am not thinking of marrying helen replied rhoda rather sharply but every marriage is not such a mistake as yours has been god knew what he was about i suppose when he brought adam and eve together there's little sense in abusing a good road just because you couldn't walk upright on it you would not have found it easy to walk with robert said helen mournfully and now he has gone off and has left me sticking in the mire it's worse than being a widow rhoda melted at once at the thought of helen's desolate condition perhaps he may really get on in australia she rejoined trying to speak hopefully and then he may send for you and the child oh i hope not returned helen with a little start if he gets on he will send home money for us but i do not want to live with him again there can be no separation so utter and hopeless as that which parts two who have been made one the closer the union the more complete is the disunion even at that moment when rhoda's wrath was hot against robert claris she was struck with helen's entire lack of wifely feeling she could almost have pitied the man who had so thoroughly alienated the mother of his child and then she reflected that this dread of reunion on helen's part told fearfully against him helen was weak but was she not also gentle and affectionate better indeed was it for them to keep asunder until another life should present each to the other under a new aspect she did not pursue the subject further with a sudden desire to be away from helen and her troubles she wrapped herself in a thick shawl and went up the fields that rose behind the cottage on the highest land the farmer was mending a fence she could hear the strokes of his mallet as he drove the stakes into the ground as rhoda drew near she stood still and looked at him a hale handsome man whose face fringed by an iron-grey beard was like a rosy russet apple set in grey lichen his smock frock showed white against the dark background of brown trees the air was so quiet that one could listen to his breathing as his strong arms dealt the sturdy blows she was proud of him as she stood there in the wide field watching him unseen he would leave her nothing save the legacy of an unstained name but the worth thereof was far above rubies no one would sneer at her as the daughter of a disgraced man no one would whisper she comes of a bad stock take heed how you trust her many a rogue has wriggled out of well-earned punishment with the aid of his sire's good name many an honest christian has gone groaning through life under the burden of a parent's evil reputation with this pride in him rhoda was unconsciously blending a pride in herself some eyes she thought are too blind to see their blessings i am quick of sight 
the author and giver of all good things, finds in me a grateful receiver. Thus she loudly echoed the Pharisee's cry, Lord, I thank thee that I am not as other men. And never, perhaps, is the divine patience so severely tried as when that self-complacent voice is heard. How sweet in Christ's ears must be those other voices, stealing up to him through the egotist's loveless te deum, breathing the publican's old prayer. God be merciful to me, a sinner. It was a day of sober brightness. A white mist had risen above the western slopes, and the setting sun shone through it. Brown furrows had begun to take a rich auburn tinge. Tree shadows crept farther and farther across the green sod. Crows flew heavily homewards. From the wet thickets came the old, fresh, ferny scents, sweetening the calm air. The mallet bows ceased. The farmer had ended his task and turned towards his daughter. "'You are not sorry to get back to our fields, Rhoda?' he said. "'You'll see the primroses showing their pretty faces by and by. "'Ah, it seems but yesterday that you and Helen were filling your pinafores with them.' "'Helen's winter has come before its time, father,' answered Miss Farron gravely. "'Her wicked husband has made her life desolate.' "'And his own, too.' added the farmer in a pitying tone. "'That is as it should be,' returned Rhoda quickly. "'He has escaped the punishment he merited, but the satisfaction in knowing that God's justice will surely reach him.' "'Aye,' murmured the farmer softly, "'God's mercy will surely reach him. "'God's favour is for those who walk uprightly,' said Rhoda. "'Ah, Rhoda,' "'The mercy is granted before they learn to walk uprightly,' replied her father. "'It comes to those who have fallen and are ready to perish. "'There are few of us who can see ourselves in every criminal, as old Baxter did, "'and there are fewer still who can believe that a man may come out of the slough of despond "'cleaner than he went in.' "'They turned towards the house, walking silently down the green slopes.' Rhoda was angry and perplexed. What was the use of living a respectable life if sinners were to be highly esteemed? When she spoke again, it was in a harsh tone. Robert Claris has found defenders, it seems. A man who has committed such a crime as his should scarcely be so lightly forgiven. There is one thing I'd have you remember, Rhoda, said the farmer patiently, and that is the difference between falling into sin and living in sin. It's just the difference between the man who loves and hugs his disease and he who writhes under it and longs to be cured. Even supposing that this is Robert's first fault, continued Miss Farron, there must have been a long course of unsteady walking before such a fall could be brought about. Maybe not her father responded. Some men lose their characters, Rhoda, as others lose their lives, by being off their guard for one moment. And when you talk of God's justice, recollect that it means something very different from man's judgment. The Lord hates the sin worse than we do, but he knows what we can never know, the strength of the temptation. By that time, the pair had descended the last slope and were drawing near the cottage. The back door stood open. Rhoda could see the red glow of the kitchen fire and the outline of her mother's figure as she moved to and fro. It was a pleasant glimpse of household warmth and light, and it charmed her ill temper away. But she did not remember that there might be wanderers in the world at that moment driven out into life's wilderness by sin, whose hearts would well nigh break at this little glimpse of a home. She did not think of that awful sense of loss, which crime must leave behind it. Perhaps that open house door 
had suggested thoughts like these to the farmer, for he paused before they entered. Rhoda, he said solemnly, never fall into the mistake of thinking that sinners aren't punished enough. It's a very common blunder. Many a man might have hanged himself, as Judas did, if Christ hadn't stepped in and shown him what the atonement is. It is to the Davids and Peters and Sauls that he says, Where sin abounded, grace did much more abound. November came to an end. December set in with biting winds and gloomy skies, and then followed a sharp, wintry Christmas. It was a hard time for the birds. Rhoda would sit at the window and watch them congregating on the briar bush in the corner of the garden. Now it was a plump thrush, puffing out its speckled breast and feeding on the scarlet hips. Now it was a blackbird with dusky plumage and yellow bill. Then a score of finches and sparrows would alight on the frozen snow and quarrel over the crumbs that she had scattered there. All day the sky was grey and clear, but sometimes at sunset a flush would rest upon the white fields, tinting them with a delicate pink of half-opened apple blossoms. On Christmas Eve, Rhoda Farron sat watching the hungry birds no longer. A little human life was drawing very near to immortality. The baby, Helen's wee, fragile baby, was hovering between two worlds. And then, for the first time, all Rhoda's sleeping instincts started up, awake and strong. Anger and selfishness were alike forgotten. Let the solemn feet of death be heard upon the threshold of the house, and all the petty wranglings of its inmates are stilled. He was coming, the angel with the amaranthine wreath. But Rhoda held the little one in her arms and prayed the father to shut the door against him. We know not what we ask when we pray for a child's life. We are pleading with the good shepherd that he will leave a little lamb in the wilderness instead of taking it into the fold. We are asking that it may tread the long, toilsome way home instead of the short, smooth path that leads straight to rest. Surely our Lord never loves us better than when he says nay to such prayers as these. When we become even as they, the little children, and enter into the kingdom, we shall understand the infinite compassion of his denial. Christmas night closed in, and outside the cottage, the mummers, gay in patchwork and ribbons, clashed their tin swords and sang their foolish rhymes. John went out and entreated them to go away. A glance through the open door showed Rhoda the clear, broad moonlight shining over the snow waste, and she heard the subdued voices of the men as they went off to some happier house. Then the door closed again, and she saw nothing but the little child's wan face. If it were taken, she thought, they should all feel something as the shepherds did when the angels were gone away from them into heaven. Even she had begun to realise that a babe is indeed God's angel in a household. Often, like those Christmas angels, it stays just long enough to be the messenger of peace and goodwill and then returns to him who sent it. Like them, it leaves us without an earth stain on its vesture, without a regret for the world from which it is so soon withdrawn. But Helen's little one was to remain. The household rejoiced, and Rhoda learned to recognise herself in a new character. She became the baby's head nurse and most devoted slave. Was there ever such a child? she asked, as it gained strength and beauty. It will be as pretty as Helen by and by. It has a look of Robert said the farmer thoughtfully. Rhoda's smiles fled. She wanted to forget the relationship between that man and her darling. Nor was she without a fear 
that it might have inherited some touch of his evil nature. Her heart never softened towards him because he was the father of the child. And yet how much richer her life had grown since she had taken the baby into it. The snow lay long upon the ground. It was so lengthened a winter that spring seemed to come suddenly. There was a burst of primroses on the borders of the fields. They lit up shady places with their pale yellow stars and spread themselves out in sheets. Every puff of wind was sweet with the breath of violets. Birds sang their old carols, now two or three clear notes, now a shake, then a long whistle. All God's works praise him in the freshness of their new life. Old dry stumps that Rhoda had thought dead and useless began to put forth green shoots. The earth teemed with surprises. All around there was a continual assertion of vitality. And so hard is it to distinguish the barrenness of winter from the barrenness of death that every spring has its seeming miracles. The tree that our impatient hands had well nigh hewn down may be our sweetest shelter in the heat of summer noontide. Not until the high winds had sent the blossoms drifting over the orchards like a second snowfall did there come news of Helen's husband. The tidings came through Mr. Elton. Claris had written to him, enclosing a letter for his wife. He had also sent notes to the amount of forty pounds to his former employer. From time to time he promised money should be forwarded until the whole sum that he had taken was restored. I believe, wrote Mr. Elton to the farmer, that he will keep his word. He does not, he declares, hope to wipe out his sin by this restitution. I am not one whit better than any other criminal, he writes, but I have been more leniently dealt with than most of my brethren. God's mercy, acting through you, has done much for me. Helen did not show Rhoda the letter that had been received. She was paler and sadder after reading it, but she said nothing about its contents. Rhoda took the child in her arms, leaving its mother sitting in silence, and went out into the garden. The wild winds had sunk to rest. A light shower had fallen in the early morning, beating out the sweetness of the new-born roses and the long, soft grass. The old walks glittered and twinkled in the sunshine. The sky was radiantly blue, and the clouds were fair. After all, thought Rhoda, looking upward with a sudden lifting of the spirit, heaven is full of forgiven sinners. End of chapter 3「Of Nelly Channel. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Jennifer Painter. Nelly Channel by Sarah Dowdney. Chapter 4 An Invitation from Squire Derrick. As the summer advanced, Helen's spirits rose. She was not the pale, plaintive woman that Rhoda had found on her return from London. Her beauty brightened visibly, and more than one neighbour remarked that it was a sin and a shame for such a pretty creature to be tied up to a man who was nothing but a cross to her. Perhaps Helen herself was of the same opinion. The baby was given up more and more to Rhoda's care while its mother went freely to the villagers' houses. She was one of those women to whom admiration is as necessary as their daily food. Her pleasure in her own loveliness amused while it saddened her cousin. There was something in it that seemed akin to the delight of a child in its fine clothes. Helen's mind had never grown with her body. But Rhoda and the others had got into the habit of viewing her weaknesses indulgently, and they gratified the little fancies that were, as a rule, harmless enough. They had their first disagreement at the end of August, 
there was an early harvest that year. In the southern counties, most of the wheat was cut and stacked before September set in. The crops were plentiful, and there was rejoicing on all sides. But it was not always the right kind of rejoicing. "'It's a strange way that some folks have got of thanking the Lord of the harvest,' remarked Farmer Farron one day. "'He gives them bread enough to satisfy all their wants, and they must needs show their gratitude by stupefying themselves with beer. I used to think, when I was a lad, that twas an odd thing for King David to go a-dancing before the Almighty with all his might. But there's more sense in dancing than in drinking for joy.' Father and daughter stood side by side, leaning against the garden wall, for it was evening, and the farmer's work was done. Just before he spoke, some drunken shouts disturbed the quiet air. Labourers were roistering in the village tavern, and many a wife's temper was sorely tried that night. "'Oh, Uncle, I am glad you don't think it's wrong to dance,' cried Helen, coming suddenly out of the house. "'Here's good news. Squire Derrick is going to give a feast in his park next Friday. "'I know that John can't go because of his sprained ankle, "'but William Gill will drive us to the park in his chaise. "'It'll be room for Rhoda and me and Mrs Gill.' "'But, Helen, I don't go to merry-makings,' said Rhoda gravely. "'We have never taken part in anything of that kind. "'And as to father's remark, King David's sort of dancing was very different from the waltzes and polkas and gallops that there will be on Friday night. Helen's face clouded like that of a disappointed child. Oh, Uncle, would there be any harm in my dancing? she asked. Not harm exactly, my girl, responded the farmer uneasily as he picked a piece of dry moss off the wall. But even when things are lawful, they are not always expedient. You are a married woman, you see, and your husband's under a cloud and miles away, poor fellow. Ah, oh, sighed Helen, I'm always doomed to suffer for his sins. I thought that perhaps a little bit of fun would help me to forget my troubles. Poor Helen was still grovelling at the foot of her mountain. Large tears stood in her soft eyes. The farmer gave her a quick glance, then looked away, and busied himself with the little cushion of moss that still lay in his broad palm. At heart he was more than half a Puritan, and hated jigs and feastings as lustily as did the Gideons and Grace Hears of Cromwell's day, but he was far too tender-natured a man to bear the sight of a woman's tears. But for that unfortunate allusion which her father had made to Robert Clarice, Rhoda would have set her face as a flint against going to the fate. But his tone of pity stirred up all her old resentment. Why was this young wife, lovely and foolish, left without her lawful protector? Had she not said truly that she was doomed to suffer for his sins? After all, it was scarcely her fault, perhaps, that she was not elevated by her trial. To erect ourselves above ourselves is a bliss that we do not all reach, and it is a bliss which bears such a close relationship to pain that one has no right to be hard on a fellow mortal who chooses the lower ground. Thoughts like these were passing through Rhoda's mind while Helen still wept silently. But it did not occur to Miss Farron that the truest kindness that can be done to another is to raise him. She forgot that it is better to stretch out a hand and say, Friend, come up higher, than to step down to his level. At that moment she thought only of pacifying Helen. Of late her cousin had grown very dear to her, partly perhaps for the sake of her little child. Her whole soul recoiled from the harvest feast. She hated the clownish merriment and the dancing and drinking. And yet, to please Helen, she was willing to endure much that was distasteful. If you would promise not to dance, Helen, she began hesitatingly. Her father looked up in undisguised astonishment. 
"'Why, Rhoda,' he said, "'I didn't think anything in the world would have made you go.' "'Oh, Rhoda, how good of you to give way!' cried Helen, brightening. "'Of course I'll promise. It's just like her, Uncle. She was always the most unselfish girl on earth. She doesn't despise me because I'm weak-minded and like a little bit of pleasure. Ah, how kind she is!' The farmer said no more. He had a great reverence for his daughter, and would not take the matter out of her hands. But he went indoors with a grave face, and Helen followed him in a flutter of delight. As Rhoda lingered that evening in the dewy twilight, she began to charge herself with cowardice. It would have been hard to have held out against Helen's desires, and yet, for Helen's own sake, ought she not to have been firm? Most of us suffer if we stifle our instincts, and hers had told her that this feast was no place for her cousin. It shall be the last time that I am weak, she thought, hoping to atone for the present by the future. I will let her have her way this once, and then I will set myself to guide her in a better path. The grey, transparent veil of dusk stole down, and the clear stars shone through it. A little wind came creeping up the garden like a human sigh. One or two white moths flitted past, and a bird uttered a sleepy, smothered note. For a minute she loitered in the porch, listening to the pleasant household stir within. Helen's laugh mingled with John's cheery tones and the clatter of supper plates. "'Where is Rhoda?' she heard her mother say. The jessamine, which grew all over the porch, swung its slender sprays into her face. The sweet, chill blossoms kissed her lips as she passed beneath them. But she went indoors with an unquiet mind. End of chapter 4《of Nelly Channel. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Jennifer Painter. Nelly Channel by Sarah Dowdney. Chapter 5 Helen Under a New Aspect. On Friday afternoon, Helen's chamber door chanced to be left open, and Rhoda caught a glimpse of a delicate silk dress lying on the bed. She went straight into the room and examined it. Bodice and sleeves were trimmed profusely with costly lace. The rich lilac folds might have stood alone, so thick was the texture. It was not the sort of dress that should have belonged to the wife of a merchant's clerk. Rhoda was perplexed. "'Isn't it handsome?' asked Helen's voice behind her. "'I hope you are not thinking of wearing it this evening,' said Rhoda. "'It is a most unsuitable dress for a country merrymaking. "'Do put on something plainer, Helen.' "'Oh, Rhoda,' she pleaded, "'I am not like you. "'I can't abide browns and greys. "'I want to be dressed as the flowers are. "'You loved the lilacs when they were in bloom. "'Why may I not copy them?' "'Their dress costs nothing,' said Rhoda, "'and the silk is a poor imitation of them. "'Even Solomon in all his glory wasn't arrayed like the lilies of the field. "'This gown must have been very expensive, Helen.' "'It is the best I have,' answered Helen, flushing slightly. "'I should like to give it an airing, Rhoda. "'I own I am fond of fine clothes, but you are so kind.' "'that you won't be angry with a poor, silly thing like me?' "'Again Rhoda's strength was no match for her cousin's weakness. "'She went out of the room without saying another word about the lilac silk. "'An hour or two later, William Gill's chaise stopped at the gate, "'and Helen came downstairs. "'She was enveloped in a large cloak "'which completely hid her dress from the eyes of her uncle and aunt.' Her face was flushed. She was in high spirits. William Gill, a prosperous young farmer, looked sheepishly pleased as she seated herself by his side. Rhoda sat on the back seat with Mrs. Gill, 
it was a still sultry evening the languor of the waning summer seemed to have stolen upon her unawares and the good woman found her a dull companion mrs gill was proud of her son proud of his fine horse a fiery young chestnut proud of the chaise which had been newly painted and varnished but these subjects had little interest for miss farron and the worthy matron became convinced that she was giving herself airs on the strength of her annuity by the time they had reached the foot of huntsdean hill she was as silent as rhoda could desire the church clock was striking seven as they turned in at the gates of dykeley park groups of people were scattered about under the trees the hall door of dykeley house stood open and the sound of music swept forth into the evening air out of doors there was the crimson of sunset staining the skies reddening the faces of the country folk and lighting up the west front of the old mansion till its red bricks seemed to burn among the dark ivy and overblown white roses quiet pools lying here and there about the park glittered as if the old cana miracle had been wrought upon them and their waters were changed to wine the colour was too intense too fiery it made rhoda think of burning cities or of the glare of beacons blazing up to warn the land that the foe had crossed the border squire derrick's old banqueting hall had been cleared out for the dancers the squire himself a bachelor of sixty received his guests as sir roger de coverley might have done rhoda saw his eyes rest on beautiful helen in the lilac silk and his glance followed her wonderingly as she went sweeping away to a distant part of the great room other looks followed her too nor could rhoda keep her own gaze from dwelling on her companion when the long cloak had been laid aside and helen appeared in the lighted room her cousin could hardly restrain an exclamation there were jewels on her wrists and bosom jewels on the white fingers that flashed when she took off her gloves to display them a miserable sense of shame and confusion overwhelmed miss farron here was helen bedizened like a begum and here were many of the huntstein folk who knew her husband's story the air seemed full of whispers rhoda grew hot beneath the broad stare of eyes yet few glanced at her the brown wren reluctantly perched beside the glittering peacock was sheltered from observation the musician struck up a lively tune and then rhoda saw that there were several gay young officers in the room they had come by the squire's invitation from the neighbouring garrison town and were evidently prepared to enjoy themselves she was scarcely surprised to see two or three of them bearing down upon helen bent on securing her for a partner she heard their entreaties and helen's denials very prettily uttered but at that moment an old friend of farmer farron's crossed the room and gave rhoda a hearty greeting then followed a score of questions about herself and her parents and in the midst of them rhoda heard helen's voice saying only one dance rhoda you'll forgive me i know rhoda started and half rose from her seat such a distressed and angry look crossed her face that the old farmer was astonished helen had gone off on her partner's arm it was too late to call her back she must take it as quietly as she could and avoid making a scene who is that lovely young woman any relation of yours miss farron asked the old man by her side my cousin rhoda answered several persons near were listening for her reply rhoda hoped that her questioner would drop the subject but he did not let me see didn't i know her when she was a child in your father's house very likely rhoda said she used to live with us when she was a little girl and did i hear that she had married he persisted she is married 
said Rhoda desperately. Her husband is in Australia. Obtuse as he was, the old gentleman could yet perceive that he had touched upon an awkward topic. Poor Rhoda was a bad actress. Her face always betrayed her feelings. She sat bolt upright against the wall, looking so intensely uncomfortable that her companion quitted her in dismay. There she remained for three long hours, sometimes catching a glimpse of the lilac silk among the dancers. From fragments of talk that went on around her, she learned that Helen was the centre of attention. And at last, when a gallop was over, and the groups parted to left and right, she caught sight of her cousin surrounded by the officers. She now saw Helen under a new aspect. Her looks and gestures were those of a practised coquette who had spent half her life in ballrooms. People were looking on, smiling, whispering, wondering. The squire himself was evidently amused and astonished. Even if she had been less beautiful, Helen's dress and jewellery would have attracted general notice. It was, perhaps, the most miserable evening that Rhoda had ever passed. "'Am I my brother's keeper?' was the question that she asked herself a hundred times. Was she indeed to blame for suffering Helen to come to this place? The music and dancing and flattering speeches had fired Helen's blood like wine. The gaiety that would have been innocuous to many was poisonous to her. At last a loud gong sounded the summons to supper. The repast was spread in a large tent, which had been erected in the park. Out swept the crowd into the balmy August night, Helen still clinging to the arm of her last partner, and carefully avoiding a glance in her cousin's direction. Rhoda strove in vain to get nearer to her. The press was too great, but she contrived to reach William Gill, and to say to him earnestly, "'We must go away as soon as supper is over, Mr. Gill.' I promised father that we would come back early. The moon had risen, large and red, and the night was perfectly still. Chinese lanterns illuminated the great supper tent from end to end. Flowers and evergreens, mingled with wheat ears, decorated the long tables. The light fell on rows of flushed and smiling faces. Rhoda, pale and sad, sat down on the end of a bench close to the tent entrance. "'I'm most worn out,' said Mrs. Gill's voice beside her. "'I'm downright glad that you're for going home early, Miss Farron. Old women like me are better abed than a junketing at this time of night. Mercy on us! How your cousin has been a-going on, my dear, and brought up so strict too!' The words cut Rhoda like a knife. There she sat, lonely and miserable, amid a merry crowd. The golden moonshine flooded the park, and the sweet air kissed her face as she turned it wearily towards the tent entrance. Once a sudden rush of perfume came in, and overwhelmed her. It was the breath of the fast-fading roses that hung in white clusters about the squire's windows, and shed their petals on the ground below. End of chapter 5 Chapter 6 of Nelly Channel This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org Recording by Jennifer Painter Nelly Channel by Sarah Dowdney Chapter 6 the master is come, and calleth for thee. Rhoda seized upon her cousin as she was passing out of the tent. She was resolved that Helen should not go back to the dancing room. What was done could not be undone, but she would take her away before the crowd had begun to disperse. Come, Helen, she said, I have your cloak and hat. You needn't go into the house again. Mr. Gill will get the chaise ready at once. Oh, Rhoda, the fun is only just beginning, pleaded Helen. 
and i have promised to dance then you must break the promise it won't be the first that you have broken to-night added rhoda sharply she wrapped helen in her cloak and tied her bonnet strings with her own hands as they stood there in the strange mingling of lamplight and moonlight she could see that the lovely face looked half frightened and half mutinous in an instant rhoda repented of her momentary harshness somehow she had never loved helen better than she did at that instant i'm sorry to spoil your pleasure darling she whispered but what will the father say if we are late helen's brow cleared without a word she walked straight to the place where the chaise was standing and climbed up into her seat william gill assisted by one of the squire's stable helpers proceeded to harness the chestnut horse and in a few moments more they had driven out of the park it was such a relief to rhoda to be going homewards that for some moments she could think of nothing else the cool night air soothed and refreshed her the rattle of wheels and the quick tramp of hoofs were the only sounds that broke the silence cottages by the wayside were dark and still the firs that bordered the road stood up rugged and black not a tree-top rocked not a branch rustled the level highway was barred with deep shadows here and there overhead there was a soft purple sky and the moon hung like a globe of gold above the faintly outlined hills as they drew near the end of the three-mile drive rhoda's troubled thoughts came flocking back all huntstein and dykeley would be talking of helen claris to-morrow her dress her jewels her levity would give the tongues of the gossips plenty of work for months to come the farrens were a proud family in their way they were oversensitive as such people always are and hated to be talked about rhoda knew that the village chatter could not fail to reach her father's ears and she knew too that it would vex him more than he would care to say as mrs gill had said helen had been strictly brought up she had lived under her uncle's roof in her childhood and had gone to school with her cousin all that had been done for rhoda had been also done for her and then the jewels little as miss farren knew of the worth of such things she had felt sure that they were of considerable value moreover they were new and fashionable and could not be mistaken for family heirlooms had robert claris purchased them in his doting fondness for his wife were they love gifts made soon after their marriage anyhow helen ought not to retain them it was plainly her duty to dispose of them and send the proceeds to mr elton rhoda determined to speak to her about this matter on the morrow just as she had formed this resolution they turned out of the highway and entered the lane leading to huntstein the road dipped suddenly a sharp hill overshadowed by trees led into the village nearly home said mrs gill rousing herself from a doze the words had hardly passed her lips when the chestnut horse started forward with a mad bound it might have been that william gill's brain was confused with the squire's strong ale a buckle had been carelessly fastened and had given way the horse's flanks were scourged and stung by the flapping strap there was a wild plunge into the darkness of the lane a terrible swaying from side to side and then a jerk and a crash at the bottom of the hill for a few seconds rhoda lay half stunned upon the wet grass and bracken by the wayside she rose with a calmness that afterwards seemed the strangest part of that night's history mrs gill was sitting on the sod staring around her in a helpless way the other two william and helen were stretched motionless upon the stony road still with that strange composure which never lasts long rhoda ran to the nearest cottage its windows were closed and all was silent but she beat hard upon the door with her clenched hands a voice called to her from within 
but she never ceased knocking until a labourer came forth. "'Hoskins!' she said as the man confronted her. "'My cousin has been thrown out of Farmer Gill's chaise. You must come and carry her home.' The man came with her to the foot of the hill and lifted Helen in his strong arms. Other help was forthcoming. The labourer's wife had roused her sons, and Mrs. Gill had collected her scattered senses. They were but a quarter of a mile from home, but the distance seemed interminable to Rhoda as she sped on to the house. The familiar way appeared to lengthen as she ran, and when at last her hand touched the latch of the garden gate, her firmness suddenly broke down. She tottered as she reached the door, and then fell into John's arms, crying out that Helen was coming. The farmer sat in his large armchair. The Bible lay open on the table before him, for he had been gathering the old strength and sweetness from its pages. He had not guessed that the strength would so soon be needed. But it was his way to lay up stores for days of sorrow, and there was a look of quiet power in his face that helped those around him. They carried Helen upstairs and laid her on her bed. The lilac silk was dusty and blood-stained, the fragile lace soiled and torn. With tender hands Rhoda unclasped her glittering necklace and bracelets. The rings, too, slipped easily from the slight fingers. When those gay trinkets were out of sight, Rhoda's heart was more at ease. Helen was their own Helen without them. The jewels had done their best to make her like a stranger. There was little to do then but to wait until the doctor arrived. As it will be with the day of the Lord, so it is often with the day of trouble. It comes as a snare. Frequently, like the stag in the fable, we are looking for it in the very quarter from which it never proceeds. It steals upon us from another direction, suddenly, swiftly, as a thief in the night. But the children of the kingdom are not in darkness, that that day should overtake them as a thief. They sleep, but their hearts wake, and there is light in their dwellings. Let the angels of death or of sorrow come when they will. They are ready to meet them. To the watchful and sober souls, the master's messengers are never messengers of wrath. Aye, though they come with dark garments and veiled faces, they bring some token of him who sends them. The garments smell of myrrh, aloes, and cassia. The glory of celestial love shines through the veil. When Helen opened her eyes and looked round upon them all, they knew that there was death in her face. They knew it even before the doctor arrived and told them the hard truth. She might linger a day or two, perhaps, just long enough for a leave-taking, and then she must set forth on her lonely journey. But how were they to tell her that she must go? What did the doctor say? she asked faintly, after a long, long silence. The day was breaking then, but they were still gathered round her bed, still waiting and watching with that new, calm patience that is born of great sorrow. Nelly, said the farmer, bending his head down to hers, the master is come and calleth for thee. The call is sudden, my dear, very sudden, but it is the master's voice that speaks. First there was a startled, distressed look, but it passed away like a cloud. The brown eyes were full of eager inquiry. Must it be? she whispered. Ah, I see it must. Oh, I am not ready, not nearly ready. There is so much to be forgiven. If I could only know that he forgives me, I wouldn't want to stay. Nelly, answered the farmer in a clearer tone, the Lord has got love and pardon for all those who want it, 
it is only from those that don't want it that he turns away his blood has washed out the sins of that great multitude whom no man can number and it will cleanse you too do you think he ever expects to find any of his children who don't need washing ay the darker they are in their own eyes the fairer they seem in his as rhoda listened to her father's words and to her cousin's low replies she began to realize that poor weak helen had felt herself to be a sinner for many a day she had felt it and had tried to forget it but this was not the first time that she had heard the master's call and yearned to follow him yet the weakness of the flesh had prevailed again and again and her feet had gone on stumbling on the dark mountains they would never stumble any more the great king had come himself to guide them over the golden pavement to the mansion prepared in his father's house all that day rhoda's mother was by the bedside rhoda herself went to and fro now ministering to the baby's wants now hanging over her cousin's pillow once she stayed out of the room for nearly half an hour and on entering it again she saw her mother strangely agitated helen's head was on her aunt's bosom and her pale lips were moving but rhoda could not hear what she said she tarried with them until the breaking of another day the sun came up shadows of jessamine sprays were drawn sharply on the white blind a glory of golden light fell on the chamber wall towards that light the dying face was turned to rhoda at that moment came a sudden impulse clearly and firmly she repeated the familiar lines that she and helen had learned years ago the wide arms of mercy are spread to enfold thee and sinners may hope for the sinless has died for answer there was a quick bright smile and then the half-breathed word forgiven only an hour later rhoda was walking along the grassy garden path with helen's child in her arms was it yesterday that they were children playing together had ten years or sixty minutes gone by since she died if she had come suddenly out of the old summer-house among the beeches a gay smiling girl rhoda could scarcely have wondered there are moments in life when we put time away from us altogether and yet one had to come back to the everyday world again a very fair world on that morning newly reaped fields lay bare and glistening in the sun thistledown drifted about in the languid air and the baby stretched out her hands to grasp the butterflies she looked up wonderingly with helen's brown eyes when rhoda pressed her to her bosom and wept end of chapter six chapter seven of nelly channel this is a librivox recording all LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Jennifer Painter. Nelly Channel by Sarah Dowdney. Chapter 7 Disposing of Helen's Jewels. A month went by. The household fell back into its old ways. The little child laughed and played and grew dearer and dearer to them all mrs farren had taken upon herself the task of looking over helen's things she performed this duty without any aid from rhoda and not one word did she say about the jewels the farmer had written to australia breaking the sad news to robert claris as gently as he could how would he receive it rhonda wondered they had left off speaking of him in her hearing they were aware of all the bitter dislike that she cherished but they never sought to soften her heart they were content 
as the wisest people are, to leave most things to time. We do not know how often we wrong a friend by hotly defending him, nor how we help an enemy by running him down. Now that Helen was gone, Rhoda was harassed by a new fear. She dreaded lest Robert should take away the child. It was more than probable that he would marry again one day. A hard-natured, selfish man, such as she believed him to be, would need a wife to slave for him. Then he would send for Rhoda's ewe lamb, and there would be an end to her dream of future happiness. She did not realise that God seldom makes us happy in our own way. Blessings, like crosses, nearly always come from unexpected quarters. We search for honey in an empty hive, and find it at last in the carcass of a dead lion. The gills, mother and son, were little the worse for that night's catastrophe. Like all tragedies, Helen's death was a nine days' wonder. There was plenty of sympathy, there were condolences from all sides, and then the excitement died out. The small topics of daily life resumed their old importance, and so the time went on. At the end of October, the farmer received a reply to his letter. Rhoda refrained from asking any questions, and they did not tell her how the widower had borne the blow. She saw tears in her mother's eyes, and thought that a great deal of love and pity are wasted in the world. Long afterwards, her opinion changed, and she understood that money is often wasted, love and pity never. Thank God, it is only the things that perish in the using, which we ever can waste. On the very day after the Australian letter came, the black mare was put into the light cart. The farmer dressed himself in his best clothes and carefully examined the harness. These were signs that he was going to drive to the town. "'Maybe it would do you no harm to come, Rhoda,' he said suddenly. "'Put on your bonnet and bring the little one.' Rhoda ran up into her room and dressed herself in haste. Little Nellie crowed with glee when her small black pelisse was buttoned on. She was quite unconscious of the compassion that her mourning garments excited. And even when she was fairly seated in the cart, her shrill cries of delight brought a smile into the farmer's grave face. It was one of the last peaceful autumn days. The early morning sky had been covered with a grey curtain, whose golden fringes swept the hills from east to west. As the sun rose higher, the clouds were lifted, the bright fringes broadened, and there was light upon all the land. Rhoda and her father did not talk much. Her instincts told her that he was disposed to be silent, and there was a great deal to occupy eyes and mind. The bindweed hung its large white flowers across the yellow hedges. The wild honeysuckle, in its second bloom, was like an old friend who comes back to comfort us in our declining fortunes. They reached at length the brow of the great chalk hill that overlooks the harbour. There lay the sea, a waste of soft blue-grey, touched with gleams of gold and dashes of silver. There, too, lay the Isle of Wight in the tranquil sunshine. The mayor trotted on, downhill all the way, till they entered the noisy streets of the busy seaport, and left peace and poetry behind. The farmer stopped at last before a silversmith's shop. He put the reins into Rhoda's hand, took a little wooden box from under his seat, and descended from the cart. For a few seconds his daughter was utterly bewildered. The stock of family plate was limited to a cream jug and spoons, and even if they had made up their minds to part with those treasures, the proceeds would hardly have recompensed them for the sacrifice. Yet what could be the contents of the wooden box that her father had carried into the shop? 
the truth flashed upon Rhoda. He was disposing of Helen's jewels. He had obtained her husband's permission to sell them. He came out again with a sober face. The silversmith came too, rubbing his hands as if he were not ill-satisfied with his bargain. He wished the farmer good day, and the mare jogged steadily back to Huntstein. But Rhoda learnt, long afterwards, that the money for which the jewels were sold did not go to Mr. Elton. It went towards the maintenance of Helen's child. End of chapter 7《ャプター・エイト・オブ・ネリー・チャンネル。This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Jennifer Painter。ネリー・チャンネル。by Sarah Dowdney。Chapter Eight。The Farm Purchased by One Ralph Channel。Eight years passed away. In Huntstein churchyard, the grass had grown over Helen's grave, covering up the bare brown earth as new interests cover an old sorrow. Little Nellie had never realised her loss. It contented her to know that her mother had been laid to rest in a sweet place and would rise again some day when the Lord called her. She always hoped that Helen might rise in the spring. And find the primroses blooming round her pretty grave. She might have fancied that, like Keats, her mother could feel the flowers growing over her. Children and poets often have the same fancies. November had come again, and with it came a new anxiety. The small farm, rented by Farmer Farren, had passed into new hands. Squire Derrick was dead. And another king arose who knew not Joseph. The heir was a needy, grasping man. Old tenants were nothing to him, and he was in want of ready money. He had made up his mind to sell the little farm. It was more than likely, therefore, that the Farrens would be turned out of the old nest. For the young, it is easy to build new homes and gather new associations around them. But for the old, it is well nigh impossible. Their very lives are built into the ancient walls. When they leave a familiar dwelling, they long to go straight to a house not made with hands, eternal in the heavens. John was now bailiff to a rich landowner in Sussex. He had a wife and child, but he was not unmindful of other ties. Come to me, he wrote. If you are turned out of the old place. But the parents sighed and shook their heads. They had not greatly prospered in Huntstein, yet no other spot on earth could be so dear to them. Whatever the Lord means me to do, I'll strive to do it willingly, said the farmer bravely. Oftentimes I'm mighty vexed with myself for clinging so hard to these old bricks and mortar and those few fields yonder. If I leave them, I shan't leave my lord behind me, and if I stay with them, he'll soon be calling me away. But you see, an old man has his whims, and I wanted to step out of this old cottage into my father's house. In this time of uncertainty, a new duty suddenly called Rhoda from home. Her father's only sister, a childless widow, lay dying in Norfolk. And sent for her niece to come and nurse her. It was decided that she must go. Her aunt had no other relatives and could not be left alone in her need. But it was with a heavy heart that Rhoda said farewell to the three whom she loved best on earth and set out on her long, solitary journey. It was a keen, clear morning when she went away. A brisk wind was blowing. The brown leaves fled before it, as the hosts of the Ammonites before the sword of Joshua. In dire confusion, they hurried along over soft turf and stony ground. It was a day on which all things seemed to be astir. Crows were cawing, 
and flying from tree to tree, magpies flashed across the road, flocks of small birds assembled on the sere hedges, and far off could be heard the clamour of foxhounds and shouts of the huntsmen. Rhoda wondered, with a pang, how it would be when she came back. Do we ever leave any beloved place without fearing that a change may fall upon it in our absence? It is at such times as these that the heart loves to rest itself upon the immutable. Lord, thou hast been our dwelling place from all generations. Thou art the same, and thy years shall not fail. It was a weary sojourn in Norfolk. The widow's illness was long and trying. But God has a way of making hard work seem easy and he lightened Rhoda's labour with good news from home. Two months passed by, and her aunt still hovered between life and death. Mrs. Farron's letters had not given any definite reason for hope, and yet hopefulness pervaded every line, and clung to every sentence like a sweet perfume. Rhoda felt its influence and rejoiced. And at last... When January came to an end, the mother spoke out plainly. The farm was purchased by one Ralph Channel. He was a prosperous man who had come from Australia and had been settled in England about a year. He was quite alone in the world and had proposed to take up his abode with the Farrens in the old cottage. The farmer was to manage everything as usual. No change would be made in any of their household ways. Mr. Channel had been acquainted with Robert Claris in Australia, and it was through Claris that he had first heard of the Farrens. What he asked of them was a home. They might have the old house rent-free if they would let him live in it with them. Thus, a heavy burden was lifted from Rhoda's heart, Mrs. Farron's letter was a psalm of thanksgiving from beginning to end. In the day when I cried, thou answerest me, and strengthenest me with strength in my soul, she wrote in her gladness, and Rhoda's spirit caught up the joyful strain. Yet she once found herself wishing that Mr. Channel had not been one of Robert Claris's friends. True, Claris had long ago restored the three hundred pounds, and had regularly sent money for his child's support. But was not the old taint upon him still? Rhoda could never get rid of the notion that he had been too leniently dealt with. Hers was a mind which always clings to an idea. Moreover, her life, from its very beginning, had been a narrow life, she had never been called upon to battle with a strong temptation. But, like all whose strength has not been tried, she believed that she could have stood any test. It is easy for him who sits in peace to cry shame upon the soldier who deserts his post. There are few of us who cannot be heroes in imagination. And most of our harsh judgments come from a narrow experience. We can only learn something of the power of divine love by knowing the evil against which it contends. Those who want to see what God's grace can do must look for its light in dark places. When February and March had gone by, Rhoda found herself free to go home. She went back to the sweet lights and shadows of April, to the glitter of fresh showers and the scent of hyacinths and wallflowers. Her mother's arms were open to her. Nellie clung to her neck, half crying for joy. Her father and Mr. Channel were out in the meadows, they told her. They would come indoors for tea. It was Nellie who had most to say about the stranger. You never knew anybody so kind, Rhoda, she said earnestly. He makes us all happy, and he's taken me to see Mother's grave every Sunday while you were away. Rhoda was standing at the back door when she saw them coming from the fields. Nellie, with her pinafore full of kittens, still chattered by her side. 
just in front of the door was the old cherry tree covered with silvery blossoms and spangled with raindrops it looked like a bridal bouquet hung with diamonds men were sowing barley in the acres beyond the fence rhoda was watching the blossoms and the sowers and yet she saw those two figures the first glance told her that mr channel was a strong man in his younger days he might have been almost handsome but he was one of those men who had lost youth early in life it was a face with which sorrow had been very busy and hard work had put the finishing touches to the lines that sorrow had begun rhoda did not know what it was in this man that made her think of luther but when she looked at him she saw the same kind of peace that the reformer's features might have worn it may be that there is a family likeness among all god's great hearts for all those who have fought the good fight must show the seal of the living god on their foreheads as well as the scars of the conflict even our dim eyes may see the difference between the marks that are got in the devil's service and those that have been won in the battles of the lord from that very day there was a change in rhoda's life some of us in looking back on our lives can remember the exact spot where the old straight road took a turn at last it had run on so long in the same even line that we thought there never would be any change at all other roads had always been crooked full of twists and ups and downs ours never varied but at last when it looked straightest and smoothest the turn came rhoda began to think that the world was widening as we all do when an expanding process is going on within ourselves first she found out that the old cottage was a much pleasanter place than it used to be and that the parents seemed growing younger instead of older mr channel discovered all their little likings and dislikings and carefully studied them some folks think they have done wonders if they scatter flowers in a friend's path but ralph channel's work was the quiet removal of the thorns perhaps the best labourers in the world are those who have striven to undo evil rather than to do good but they are not those who have had the most praise he had brought a goodly number of books to huntstein but rhoda learnt more from the life histories that he told her than from the printed volumes they helped her to read the books by a new light in his way and it was a very unassuming way he had been doing missionary work in melbourne and in listening to him rhoda first understood how christ's love follows the sinner and hunts him into the darkest corners of the earth rather than lose him in this universe where wheat and tares grow together and angels and devils strive together mercy never rests for the prince of darkness is not so active as he who hath said lo i am with you always even unto the end of the world if the devil goeth about as a roaring lion seeking those whom he may devour the good shepherd is seeking too to save them that are lost there is only one power stronger than hate and that is love in this strain did mr channel talk to rhoda the spring passed away summer days came and went and still no mention had ever been made by either of them of robert claris at last however his name was brought up abruptly by rhoda herself end of chapter 8 Chapter Nine of Nellie Channel. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by John Brandon. Nellie Channel by Sarah Doudney. Chapter Nine. 
the consciousness of battle on a sunday afternoon these two ralph and rhoda had strayed out into the old orchard at the back of the house the summer world was just then in all its glory the meadows looked as if a flowery robe had been shaken out over them the orchard grass was full of tall shiny buttercups and large field daisies resplendent in their snowy frills a turquoise sky smiled down through the leaf-laden boughs above their heads bees were murmuring all around them mr channel asked rhoda suddenly you know nelly's father don't you he stooped and gathered one of the large daisies for a moment there was no reply the bees filled up the pause while she waited for his answer yes he said at last i know him well is he really penitent she inquired doubtfully does he think that what he has done has blotted out the past it's easy to whitewash a dirty wall but the stains are underneath the whitewash still there is a vast difference between the stain which is only whitewashed over and that which christ's blood has blotted out replied mr channel i don't believe that robert claris can ever forget the past or think that he has atoned for it but he knows the lord has put away his sin how does he know it rhoda demanded until he had committed that great crime ralph went on he knew nothing at all of the love of christ he had been a moral man satisfied with his morality then came secret sorrows then much worldly perplexity followed by a strong temptation and he fell and when he lay groveling in the dust the lord's voice travelled to him along the ground while he walked erect he had never heard it wasn't mr elton over merciful to him asked rhoda i've often thought so a sudden light seemed to kindle in ralph's eyes there are many he said who pray sunday after sunday that the lord will raise up them that fall and yet do all they can to keep the fallen ones down mr elton was not one of those he thought that if half the blows that were spent on sinners were bestowed upon satan the evil one would indeed be beaten down under our feet god bless him he saved a sinner from the consequences of one dark hour again there was a pause this time it was broken by little nelly who came bounding in between them ralph bent down and clasped the child closely in his arms oh my darling he said as he held her may the lord make you one of his handmaidens may he send you forth to raise up them that fall and to bind up the broken in heart perhaps it was not the first time that nelly had heard this prayer it did not surprise her as it did rhoda miss farron watched ralph's face earnestly till it had regained its usual look of peace mr channel she began yielding to a sudden impulse i'm sure you must have suffered a great deal forgive me for saying so much she added but i've sometimes thought that you have the look of a victor he turned toward the house holding nelly's hand in his i must answer you in another's words he replied they are better than any of mine to me also was given if not victory yet the consciousness of battle and the resolve to persevere therein while life or faculty is left the consciousness of battle rhoda repeated to herself perhaps that was what st paul felt when he found a law in his members warring against the law in his mind and perhaps it's a bad thing to be conscious of no warfare at all and then she began to wonder if she were anything like robert claris before he fell had she ever really heard the lord's voice were not her ears deafened by the clamour of self-conceit alas it goes ill with us when we mistake the voice of self-congratulation 
for the voice of god but there came a time when rhoda reached the very bottom of the valley of humiliation she grew conscious that she a strong self-reliant woman had silently given a love that had never been asked of her when a man takes a woman by the hand and lifts her above her old self it is ten to one that she falls in love with him we all know what it is to wonder at the change that love makes in a woman we have marvelled often what that clever man could have seen in this commonplace girl but we admit that he has made her a new creature perhaps like the great sculptor he attacked the marble block with divine fervour believing that an angel was imprisoned in it and his instincts were not wrong at all the shapeless stone was chipped away and the beautiful form revealed but rhoda had no reason to think that ralph channel cared for her more than for others in every respect he was above her the rector rectors are great persons in country villages had found out that mr channel was a thoughtful and cultivated man the rector's family said he was charming and they wondered why he shut himself up with the farrens in their dull cottage nobody ever intimated that he was thinking of rhoda all the country people had settled that she was to be an old maid she was too good for the farmers and not good enough for the squire's sons and for many a year rhoda had been very comfortably resigned to her fate bit by bit however she had let her heart go and she awoke one day suddenly and miserably to the knowledge that she had parted with the best part of herself there is no need to tell how or when she made the discovery a chance word a trivial incident may send us to look into the casket where we kept our treasure and we find it empty end of chapter nine recording by john brandon